okay, we're good. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, welcome to the February 8th, 2022 meeting of the Park and Recreation Committee. Due to the surge in local COVID-19 cases, this meeting is being held electronically to ensure the safety of all residents and staff. All members of the commission and staff are participating from their homes or offices. For members of the commission, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and raise your hand if you would like to speak. We will have roll call votes for each motion this evening, as well as for adjournment. I will ask staff member Janet Canton to call roll after each motion. I will repeat the motion for the record before we vote and will also repeat who made the motion and seconded. Before we begin, there are a few things I'd like to cover for those listening in or watching online. The public has two ways to view the meetings tonight. They can watch the live stream on the city's YouTube channel or listen via phone using the WebEx call in number. There is no community comment during the meeting tonight. The city is committed to hearing and receiving your input on matters. The public can send in comments to the commission through the commission correspondence web form on your web on our website. The recording of the meeting will also be available to watch on the city's website tomorrow. Go to watch a meeting link under the I want to tab on the home page. Thanks in advance for your patience as we work to conduct this meeting online. We hope there will not be any issues, but be assured we will do our best to continue the meeting as best we can if there are glitches. Thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight for your interest in the Parks and Recreation Commission and our work in the city. Um, Janet, please um, call. I'd like to call the order then. Uh, Janet, can you do the roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Good? Here. Commissioner Itis? Here. Commissioner Jaw? Here. Here. Commissioner McCauley? Here. Commissioner Nelson? I don't hear, but there are things on there. Um, Commissioner Strother? Here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item three, um, I'll ask for the motion and a second for approval of the meeting agenda. So moved. Second. The motion for approval of the meeting agenda was made by Eileen and seconded by Greg. Janet, roll call, please. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Commissioner Strother? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item four, uh, I ask for um, a motion and second for approval of the minute meeting minutes from uh, January 11th. So moved. Second. A uh, motion for approval of minutes, uh, minutes uh, was made by Commissioner McCauley and seconded by Commissioner Good. Janet, please. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Commissioner Strother? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item five reports and recommendations. The first one, um, is, uh, Tracy, I believe is going to do something on the senior center update, please. Uh, good evening, chair and commissioners. Um, tonight, um, Nicole Gorman is here, recreation supervisor for the Adina senior center, and she's going to give a brief update on programs at, at, and activities taking place at, at the senior center. Thank you, Tracy. Good evening, commissioners. I um, just wanted to give you a brief update. Uh, I presented back in February of 2021, so I thought I'd just let you know some of the things that have happened up until now from then. We started limited in-person programming back at the center on March 1st of 2021. We were offering um, programming for up to 10 people and we were filling the programs. Uh, we went to full capacity on July 1st and 
We are continuing to offer virtual and in-person programming as well as take-home kits. So similar to the Rectivity kits that we did that in 2020. And then Laura uh, Fulton, who is the new Recreation Supervisor for Arts and Culture, she offices out of the Senior Center and has been adding more art programs at the facility. And then we've had some staffing changes. Um, we had hired a program coordinator last January, a year ago, and she received a full-time offer at a nonprofit. So she left in September of 2021. And then at the end of September, we had our new program coordinator start and her name is Bree. So she is slowly getting integrated into the facility. And then one of our other um, longtime part-timers had left in December of 2021. His name was um, Ed Bergeron and he was with us for five years and he covered all of our evening and weekend rentals and programming outside of facility hours. And um, we were able to fill his position with uh, Joe Voltaggio and he started at uh, the beginning of January of this year. Um, our building rentals are starting to pick up. We have had we have resumed our regular rentals, which includes a church on every Sunday. And then the Greater Twin City Youth Symphonies rents us um, throughout the school year. And then Park and Recreation has been utilizing the facility after hours for dance, gymnastics, and music together classes. And so the, the center has been a bit busy. That's all I have. Any questions? Um, Nicole, thanks. Um, the hours of operation, can you just kind of refresh that for me? Of course. It's Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. And then this is Julie. Um, you, I, I have a full disclosure, a child who's doing uh, dance in the evening there. Um, and so do you just have then the one staff person who's there um, outside of the community um, programming, right? Like there's the dance teacher, but there's always one staff person at the front desk. Is it just one person who's there in the evening and or and is it just there through the time that the programming is done? So Joe is the individual. He is the senior center staff and he does cover the evening programs and rentals on the weekends. So yes, he's the one staff we have in the evenings. He's great, so. Thank you. I'll let him know that. So I think to clarify, Nicole, the senior target hours are eight to 4.30, and then the rentals and program activity is on top of that for weekdays and evenings, correct? Yes. Hey, Nicole, this is Greg. Just a couple of questions. Uh, number one, as you've come open, or back to full time, I think, as you called it as of July 1. I'm interested to see what have you seen the attitude uh, and comfort level with uh, people coming uh, on site versus people participating virtual? Uh, it's quite divided. We have a group of participants that don't feel comfortable coming back to the facility yet. And so we have seen certain programs um, not excelling like they had pre pandemic. And then we have other groups of people that are coming and they are just so excited to be back. So one example would be our American Contract Bridge League. We have about anywhere from uh, lately because of cold weather, the COVID surge and people flying south for the winter, the numbers have gone down a little bit, um, but typically we get 40 to 80 people for our bridge league when it's at full capacity. And right now we're averaging probably between 20 and 40 for that event. Um, our other programs are one-time educational offerings, which we typically filled pre-pandemic to like room capacity, which is anywhere from 40 to 48 people. Um, we're now seeing maybe 10, 15 at most. 
Okay. So we are seeing uh, a change. Um, but I think as we get closer to spring, I think we'll see some of those programs start to ramp back up. Uh, and then our 500 car group, we started off with one table of four and we're now up to 14. Mm -hmm. So it's wow. fun to see the difference and what is picking up interest and what's kind of waning. Yeah. And I know, second question, I know it may be difficult to assess during COVID, but with the opening up of the residential building across the street, have you seen that impact participation, new groups of people coming in that maybe had not utilized the facility before? Um, not as many as I had hoped. Okay. We do have quite a few participants who had, were participants of the center prior to the building going up, and then they moved in there. So. It's hard to say. I would maybe a handful of new residents that have been coming over. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just have one question. Nicole, um, go ahead. Sorry. Do you think if um, we had the senior center in a building that had um, more of a community, not a total community center like some of the suburbs that have a lot of land? But more of a community, a, a center of involvement in other aspects. Do you think that the there would be more interest or more participation if we had other recreational or just activities involved or other interests? I think it would definitely help. Um, our biggest, our biggest uh, hurdle is parking at our current facility. So I have some space and we are all growing our space, but parking is the biggest concern. Maybe if I could just build cool. off of that, if you, if you think about what we could add from either programming activities, or if we had something else, as we think about potentially another site in the future, if we had something else in the space facility itself, what might be two or three of the items that come top of mind? More intergenerational programming would be, we did a Deary Dyna program, which was a pen pal program during um, 2020 that we had 336 people participate in. Um, and we've done buddy bingo before at the facility where we would partner with uh, preschoolers and have them team up with seniors to learn the game of bingo. Uh, and that was quite popular. We filled our fireside or the banquet room at the center for those events. Um, just trying new things. Like we have the aging mastery program. I would like to get that up and running and have that be a, a bigger opportunity for growth. Um, uh, I would like more art programming for that demographic. And I know that Laura is working on it. And it, I mean, we're filling the classes in the space that we have for that. Um, I have so many ideas. I have an idea book, but. Okay. All right. Good. Good. That helps. Um, Nicole? Yes. Um, what would be a good time to visit? when it's full or okay. just to come and see the facility? Well, both, some of both. I mean, I'm um, I'm not a bridge player, my wife is, but we do play 500, but I just would like to see, you know, the activity, kind of the buzz, you know, of the facility and just um, can drop in. Is it okay just to drop in or is there you a particular and... time that, yeah, sorry. Um, you are more than welcome to come at any time. I would say if you want to come and see it when it's at full capacity, Mondays at about one o'clock would be a great time for you to pop in and take a look through the facility. Um, <clears throat> we have a choir that meets on Mondays in our Grandview room. We have the bridge league that meets, and then we also have the 500 club that's playing. Um, quieter mornings would be our um, Monday morning before bridge starts arriving as well as Wednesday mornings. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions for Nicole while she's here? Very good. Thanks for coming and uh, a lot of information. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I'll just add a, a little bit more about Nicole. When she talks about her idea book, that is uh, um, extremely true. Um, she's one of our uh, most creative and, and dedicated staff. And um, while she gave you an update this evening on the senior center activities, Nicole actually does a lot more than just senior focused activities. She does a, a lot of events and other programs within the community for that. And she and I always joke when she mentioned the item about being more intergenerational. We always kind of have a joke about the worst thing you can do for a senior center is call it a senior center. Um, and uh, and just the adaptability of Nicole and her staff throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, one of the things that she didn't really mention were trips. And that was a, a focus before. Those are very limited and just, you know, the ability to bring people together with what people are worried about and, and what they're comfortable with. So. I um, wanted to thank her and her staff uh, that operate that facility over there um, for, a, for a quality demographic and difficult times. So I wanted to say thank you to her for that. We will move ahead to item B under five, 2022 work plan. If you want to kind of you know, give us uh, an introduction, Barry, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Um, this is your opportunity to uh, discuss and provide any updates, <clears throat> excuse me, that you might have um, on any of your, your work plan items. I'll uh, just touch on a few. Um, this afternoon, I had shared out a, a draft of information to the the leads for initiative number two um, on that. So that should be in your, your inbox and some additional details that uh, had been put together. Uh, initiative number uh, five, um, you don't have an update on that. Um, Tom and I will have to provide you items to discuss on that one. And then for initiative number six, um, last, uh, month you did discuss and provide some feedback to uh, Bill Neuendorf who attended the meeting. Uh, the full city council actually looked at that Grandview plan at their regular meeting last Wednesday. So while um, you've already reviewed and comment on that, um, while Commissioner McCauley will be off the hook after this month, I guess you could say, um, for Commissioners Haas and Struthers, I think it would be important if um, as that comes back around, because it's kind of gone through this concept sketch plan portion, um, we continue to kind of connect you to that and any updates that are going on with, with the Grandview plan um, as that goes on. So um, between the HRA and the city council, we'll, we'll try to keep you informed on, on when those items are um, for that plan. So those are kind of the, the updates on those pieces for that. Um, one quick item on initiative number four is that uh, city manager uh, wants to put together a, a task force to look at the uh, Braemar master plan specifically focused to facility upgrades and expansion. So I think as you discuss that um, for your work plan, that's going to come back around to you as a review of the master plan um, would be to uh, discuss representation on a, on a task force from the commission level um, before that comes through. So it'd be uh, members of the community, mainly primary users of Braemar Arena, um, that would be on that. But we would like to have some Parks Commission representation on that task force that the city manager assembles uh, to kind of have obviously a voice on that, but also to help follow the, the process and the consistency as that comes before you. Um, yet this uh, this spring. So uh, those are the updates I have on that. I've not received any other updates from commissioners, but if they have any this evening, we can discuss those further. Um, Perry, I have one question. Um, well, a couple of them. Um, thank you for your information or the stuff on number two. I mean, that was uh, um, 
it's a lot of stuff there. Um, on uh, on number four, when when uh, you said that there would probably be a task force, can you, knowing that there was a resolution made by the council uh, a few days ago, January nineteenth, um, can you give us an idea about the formation of the task force, the timing, and then because my feeling of reading that four page resolution. I get somewhat excited about the it's moving on the fast rail, so to speak. So um, certainly the three of us that are on there at this point, plus any new. Can you just give us a little bit of a perspective about timing? Yeah, the, the city manager um, has kind of started drafting the formation of representation on that. So we want to have uh, Obviously, a chair. We want to have Parks Commission representation. We'd like City Council representation. Um, the City Council representation will probably be in advisory fashion, um, just to ensure that, um, again, kind of having that consistency from beginning through process to when it comes to them. So, um, so we'll be looking for council uh, representation on that, and then also from the uh, Edina Youth Hockey Association, the figure skating, uh, the City of Lakes figure skating club representation, obviously representation from the school district, um, and then uh, and then a couple of members of the the public and that are related to the Bremer uh, Arena concept. Um, he would like to form that um, towards the end of this month to have a series of meetings upon that, and then bring forth. Uh, a recommendation or an, an advisement opinion. Um, if there's consensus to the Parks Commission, you know, most likely around April, and then get that in front of the council as well to then uh, to make a recommendation about an amendment to the master plan. I have a question. You mentioned um, citizens, uh, members of the public related to the Graymar Arena project. Sounds like the hockey associations covered, the ice figure skating covered. <laughs> that statement concerns me that we're just going to only have people that are focused on the arena looking at the entire Braemar master plan. Do you want to reword that or is or clarify yeah, that? I, I may be talking off the cuff a little bit too much. Um, I know we want to have the consistency because the main focus is around the arena. However, to have some external representation on that as well, because I think it is important um to look at the other facilities within the park right um and maybe they're not included in the local option sales tax pursuit but i think it's important if we look at the master plan to look at the other facilities within that and say yes other pursuits should be had in that fashion if that makes sense yeah i mean if you don't have any follow-up on that i guess i do because now i I thought I knew where you were coming, and maybe now I've grown a little bit more concerned with your last statement. Two questions. One, when we had the presentation from the gentleman from the Hockey Association a few months ago, it was stated that the extra ice sheet was a bonding deal and not a loss deal. Is that differentiation still true? That has actually changed. Um, okay. Yeah, the support for the state bonding to the legislative representatives um has determined that it's not feasible palatable or um i think there's there's concern about how that would flow through the legislative process so in exchange for that the legislative representation for edina has agreed to open up the lost bill and add in that funding as part of the local option sales tax Okay, so that, that's helpful. And so now I do attach somewhat more to what Eileen was saying, in that when we created the Braemar Master Plan, it was probably, I don't know if it's fair to say 80-20, almost 90-10, the rest of Braemar Park and the facility itself was a small piece of that. So now if the, if the seesaw on this is going the other way around, I would be very much concerned if it all became a lost about Braemar Arena and not all the other components of the Braemar Master Plan that we developed, because I think those are the ones that are going to have 
uh, a strong connection to other parts of our community, you know, outside of those that just enjoy sheets of ice. Just to clarify, um, the amount of funding is an increase request that the state legislator would flow through the process. It would not take away funding from the other parts of the master plan that were already looked at. So. Good. And I, I think we just want to make sure that 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 we give both sides of that some good attention, right? So it doesn't just become a you know a, a Braemar ice issue and not uh, not ask other aspects of the master plan. In lieu of bonding, it would be to increase the amount of capacity for sales tax. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one comment then. Yeah, in response to Greg a little bit, the of the total that I have according to that resolution made on the 19th, the park portion, so to speak, is about 15% now of the total. Yeah, the rest of it is arena ice that comprises about 45 million now. Right. From a dollar's perspective, yeah. I would I would expect that would be correct, right? From, right. from impact impact to the park and other amenities and attractions that we were trying to build into it. Uh, you know, the as I said, when we at least created the Braemar master plan, we weren't really touching the facility itself from an asset being Braemar Arena. We were looking at at other aspects of the park. So but I would absolutely yeah. agree and understand if the dollars swing more towards the enterprise of Braemar Arena in order to do what we're now talking about doing without the, the bonding bill support. So I'm not sure about the 15% yeah. chair itis, but the amounts for the other aspects that were previously identified remain the same. So the amount right. identified right. for Fred Richards right. stayed the same, the Braemar right. Master Plan stayed the same. The difference now is the amount of infrastructure investment that is needed inside the arena and potential expansion. So um, I just wanted to highlight that's kind of the piece that has delta so, or changed. Yeah. The other aspects remain um, the same for their allocation requests. Yeah. So I get, you know, our initiative um, is to provide support. That's what it says, provide support for educational opportunities for the lost. So since this is now three times the size, and now there's gonna be a task force involved here also, does that change in any way the work that at this point the three of us have been assigned to do? Or let's say there's a task force, and I don't know the limitation on the size of a task force, but let's say, let's say there's 12 people. How does that, is there a relationship between that group of people and the three of us from the park board of what we're trying to do in terms of educating people about the loss. Because this initiative has changed for us substantially since January 19th, I think. Only because of the magnitude and the allocation of dollars, I think. So I'm just, I'm not concerned. I just want to know, you know, where's where's our relationship to the task force and the change in this substantially versus what we thought last month. Even last month when we talked about this, this is a lot different. Yeah, I, I think in two ways it would change. One, it would change the aspect of um, this will include not just three people assigned to an initiative, but in a separate sense, the entire commission. So from one aspect, uh, the formation of a task force to look at facility improvements is a precursor to should or should not the master plan be amended. So there's this this kind of a, a new ask of of the community, right, to look at adding additional ice sheets. So that's a new ask that needs to come through a process. Um, then there's also the ability of educating the public at various opportunities on the referendum. And that is kind of the primary of the three, but I think as we know, that could impact the entire commission as well. So it's a little bit of twofold. Um, what we're waiting right now on before formation and to look at the plan is, we had talked about it a bit last fall when uh, the, the representatives came and said, we'd like to make this request and that's, we need to do an operational assessment. And I think Commissioner Good, I think you're 
concern at the time was, do you have the staff capacity to undertake that? Um, you know, what's the impact on staff? What we have done is we've um, um, looked at outside help to facilitate that. And it's an operational assessment, an operational review of what would that occur? Um, so part of what the task force would have to look like is in what we would bring through as part of the master plan amendment is what is the impact to the arena? Um, and we don't have that, that uh, information done yet, but it's what's it gonna do to its cost recovery metrics? What would it ca um, cause from a staffing perspective? What does it cause from, um, does it um, impact the amount of available ice in the community? To what extent does it meet the needs of our users? So um, once we have that, we can have more conversations around, is this basically, you know, and you break it all down, is, is it a good idea or a bad idea that we do this, right? Um, I think we we always say in the ice arena realm is you can never build enough ice arenas from 3 to 7 p.m. in the winter. You will never have enough of them. But I think what we need to be conscious about, and that's why we're looking at it from an operational assessment, is what does that mean for a Friday night in July? Um, how does that impact us from a year-round standpoint? Because we know there isn't enough ice in the winter, but how does that impact? What else would we have to do? How do we staff it? How do we manage it? What does it do to our capital requests and our capital replacements? Um, that's the information we need to kind of start this and take you through that process of, is this a good idea or a bad idea, basically? So it's a little bit of um, a two-tiered, I guess you could say, two different requests to the commission. One to help educate, and then as part of a formal process of coming through and reviewing that request, and should the master plan be amended? And to what extent, you know, I think this is an opportunity to look at, as we've you've just discussed with Nicole and Align, what else could we do at a different type of a facility? And, you know, there's been discussions around um, the golf course as well, um, you know, out into the future of what could that facility include, um, indoor use, intergenerational use. So I think it's an opportune time to say, we're looking at the master plan, what else could be in it? Yeah, as a as a bit of an anecdote to the, to that, uh, Perry, we had some visitors in this past weekend from Connecticut, and we took them to the girls' high school hockey game at Braemar, and they were very impressed with the facility. And the gentleman asked me, "So does this place get shuttered during the summer?" And I'm like, "Well, no, 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 not exactly. <laughs> it's it, it's a challenge, but it's utilized, and that's part of what we're trying to. It's intended to be a year-round facility." And he was like, really, what, what do you do with indoor ice in June and July and August? So, you know, it's just kind of an external lesson of there's a story to tell there. And maybe those of us in Edina are much more readily, you know, catching on to it. But uh, it, it, it's, it'll be a challenge. And the only other thing I'd ask, too, as this task force gets developed, and, and you're going to be obviously closer to it, and better insight onto it. But... As this has changed and the facility impact becomes a bigger portion of this, is to just have a bit of a probing to say, you know, we've got three of us on this initiative. What, what, how many of us should be involved in that task force? Right? Does it absorb all three of us if it's big enough to allow it? I would think, I would hope at least two of us could be representing it, uh, but not just say, you know, potentially to just have the city manager say, well, yeah, we'll give you one spot and you're going to have to kind of deal with that but so that would be just one thing i'd ask you to kind of probe a little bit as that gets created and i think i'd love to hear from the three of you as well if you know do you want that to be which three you know um based on your schedules and time um you know how would that occur to to be on that and obviously recognizing that this ends up coming back to all nine of you eventually once appointments are done yep just without getting into the, I want to follow up on Greg's. Um, you know, the, the timing is such, <clears throat> so let's say the task force is established and, and I mean, we are up against a hard date in November. Yep. Um, so there's got to be a lot of work spent in terms of the numbers. Um, and I can't recall uh, the $8 million for the, I'm going to tie into Greg a little bit. The $8 million that was, quote, parks. Right, the trails, the mountains, and all that. I think there was, I can't recall exactly, but there's contingency money in both these estimates, I'm sure. I, I just, you know, um, 
I'm adamant about that task force of making sure that we get, you know, what was allocated to us in the first master plan. It just, um, you know, I don't want just because now we've become part of a new master plan and oh, by the way, you know, the parks get $8 million. Um, we all know that costs can escalate. You know, what we think might be $45 million could be $55 million by the time we get done. And, you know, I'm just, I know we're, this is way ahead of schedule, but I just want to make sure that, that um, um, we get adequate representation at the table. Yeah. But, yeah, just to, just to comment on that, I think that's been um, pretty clear to me. And I think, you know, we'll have to discuss how to make that clear to other people is that um, yeah. one of the things that I've, I've kind of always said along this process is I never really wanted to break up the master plan and pursue individual pieces of it because some one or something in the master plan could is always left behind. They're always a secondary priority. They're always part of phase three um, that either runs out of money or you know isn't a priority at the time or or whatever it might be. So I think that's that's I believe the beauty of saying this is the amount for those needs. Then this is the amount for those right. needs. Right? Um, right? Is that the, the the goals for that when you look at it? You know the pedestrian trail system, the mountain biking, the on the and to be clear, like the no snowmaking ski items, right? Uh, you, you've gone through the ski making or the snow making thing, right? Um, you know, the, the ADA improvements, the Courtney Field improvements, adding a playground, um, you know, additional seating, you know, those types of things are key to that plan, right? And that's why, you know, in my judgment, it's really hard to, to try to break that up because then you're, you're, you're trying to pick winners and losers. And the, the goal of keeping it all together and keeping it as a master plan is then everything that was important at the to the community is then funded. I think that needs to be pretty clear. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, Great. Uh, any other questions on this particular one? Or um, I have obviously for myself, having gone through a major renovation um, and knowing the. Uh, Concerns there, um, and I've I've said this to the director already. I'd certainly like to be a part of this. I just, it's part of our park system, you know. First of all, and it's you know one of the most integral enterprises that we have in our community. And I just, um, um, I just feel that the parks need to be a very integral part of just. Um, how we approach this. So enough said on my part. Um, uh, if anybody else has any comments uh, on theirs, um, yeah. in talking to, go ahead, sorry. Oh, yeah, let's go ahead, Rick, you can add and I'll follow you. Um, mine is kind of a, a conclusion, so you go ahead, sorry. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to add on initiative one, Corn and, I, Corn and I did have a chance to meet after our last meeting, uh, and I got a chance to just compare notes and get her inputs and insights from having led the first part of this initiative uh, last year. Uh, and I'd break it down at this point as a framework for the new team going forward in kind of four parts, uh, content, method of delivery, resources, and then the challenge, an overall challenge to be successful. Uh, and I think as I look at where we stand today, uh, the work that was done on the team that Corin led last year, we probably got you know, 80 to 85% of content. Yes, it needs to be maybe sharpened up, buffed up a little bit, add a couple things, update a couple things, but the content is in, is in relatively good shape. From a methods perspective, um, I think we've identified some things. We got the note from Scott that uh, that he said we could use two town talk events. We've always had the idea of multiple community gatherings, though none of those have really been happening. So you know, maybe we're at 20% uh, on methodology of the delivery, but then it kind of falls off, right? When we talk about resources to really put it together, I gave a current estimate of about 10% because we have 
our commission members, but we really haven't thought through on uh, delivery of content to think about you know, how else do we utilize staff, uh, city communications, uh, residents potentially to bring in some, some broader insights. So I think we have some work to do to think about resources to how we deliver it all. And then ultimately the bottom line challenge is how to best tell the story and engage the community. And I think I put that as a foundation or maybe an umbrella over the first three to think about how do we get creative uh, and Corin had some interesting ideas in our discussion on this as well, but how do we get creative in telling this story that people really, they want to reach out and find it. They hear about it even if they didn't attend an initial event and, uh, and it becomes useful content that's available on an ongoing basis. So still obviously some work to do ahead of us on initiative one, but that's kind of how I would frame it up for the rest of the team as we engage in it the rest of the year. And Corin, I know you're on with us as well. If you have some additional insight to add, that'd be appreciated. No, Greg, I think you did a great job of um, bringing it all together. I think we had a little stall there for a little bit, but I think we have what we know. We know what we want to sh share out. Um, if the question is just how we're going to do it. And um, I think really the big push is on how do we get resources that are actually um, marketing or communication or script writing experts that um, is not our forte to help create how we want to share it out. Yep. So that's where we, <clears throat> that's where we stand on one, Rick. Okay, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, as Perry said earlier tonight, she sent uh sent to me i think brian and matt and eileen i don't know about eight or nine pages of uh, alternative funding uh strategies options um i can only thank you ahead of time it's it's it was a lot of work that you've done um we've always considered i think uh, a high relationship between or correlation between uh initiative two and four, because, um, you know, the sales tax is gonna afford us to complete two master plans that have sat on the table for uh, many years at this point. So um, so it looks, it looks positive um, for at least those two going forward this year. A lot of work coming up, I think in the near future, um, you know, if, if certainly if initiative four is moving ahead um, soon, so that's what I have on two. Again, thanks to Perry for sending that, uh, all that information to us. Chair, just based on that, um, do you want to let me and staff know next steps on that after you kind of get settled on that information? Sure. Yeah. I think what, what uh, as we talked yesterday, and my thinking for every, every initiative is that um, you know, now that the likelihood of going back to uh, virtual instead of in-house or in-person meetings, that we should probably make some type of commitment. I think uh, Greg and your group have been very good about it. And just having some type of um, scheduled meeting in between our park meetings. So we just, um, I think some of these initiatives are very time sensitive in terms of work having to get done um so i just would think that we're going to do that i know on ours and um just uh, it'd be nice if every every group would uh, you know make that commitment to have uh, a meeting certainly between our park meetings schedule so i don't know if that answered your question perry or And then I'd be remiss, um, since Irv is on the line, if she wanted to nominate herself for any yeah. initiatives as well. Or she can think about it and let us know.
Uh, Madam Chair, do you have any Go additional ahead. updates on that? I don't if anybody else has others or if not, we can. Um, we can move ahead to item C under five today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the commission, um, we can conduct this. We do have a quorum, so we can, can we can conduct this business item as well. Um, February is your annual uh, commission elections. Um, this evening, you need to select a, a chair and then a, a vice chair um, by going through a, a nomination process. So um, the first step is to make nominations for chair. Um, anyone can nominate uh, any member of that uh, that is on the commission. They may also nominate themselves for the position. Um, there has to be a second for each nomination, and then there would be a vote. Um, and in case of a, of a vote this evening, Janet will we'll call roll because we're virtual um, rather than, than putting hands up and things like that. So we would call roll. Um, after a chair is selected, then the floor would be open to nominations for a vice chair. Uh, the, the role of chair and vice chair are identified within your, your packet, and they serve for one year. So. Not sure if you had any questions on that. Otherwise, um, we can start with that uh, uh, election process. Um, I would like to nominate Rick Bites for chair. Um, I think uh, he's done a really good job over the last two years through these difficulties, and he's key to the alternative funding and some of the key initiatives that uh, the commission has to work on going forward. So I nominate Rick. I'd second that. I'd love to see Rick be able to lead us when we're not in a COVID virtual time. So hopefully we'll get to that this year. Hopefully. We're almost there. We're back together for a short period. I know it. We had a brief window, even in City Hall once, right? Right. You're right. You're right. I remember telling Commissioner Nelson, we just hoped we had enough hand sanitizer. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask one last time if there are any other nominations, otherwise we can get to calling roll on the, the current one on the floor. Janet, would you would you call roll on the motion for Rick Itis for chair made by Commissioner McCauley and seconded by Commissioner Good? Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Struther? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. And your next order of uh, business on this item is the election of a vice chair. Um. I would like to nominate Greg Good if you will accept. We have four new members coming on. I think uh, Gray's experience will be uh, critical moving forward. Um, so if he's willing to accept, I would like to nominate Greg. I'd like to second it if he wants to take it. Greg does, did a great job last time he did it. I, I appreciate that. I'm certainly willing. Uh, we don't have many other candidates on our call today to, to point out. I would love to see one of our other current candidates have been here to step in and do it, but um, I'm certainly happy to support Rick in the year ahead, and maybe we can develop uh, develop the leadership for the year after that. And find the money tree too. Yeah, I'll keep looking for that corn. Yeah, I think he did yeah. say there's one out there somewhere. I just want to clarify that I've got that right. The motion was made by Commissioner McCauley, McCauley and the second was by Commissioner Nelson. And I'm probably breaking all the like Robert rule of order and all of this, but I will say I really appreciate Greg, Commissioner Good, your willingness to um, step up and help lead us through a period of transition. I am. Um, I appreciate it. I know it uh, It does not. It um, Vice chair um, is a little less time than chair, but um, it, it takes some time and commitment and appreciate your willingness to step up. Sure. You know. Thank you. Does it does it come with seventy rounds of golf as well? 
No, you, you actually have to do 80 this year. Oh, I, 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 maybe That's I don't the benchmark. As much. If I can get to 35, I'd be way ahead of the game. You okay. You're not guaranteed to be successful. <laughs> yeah. That's a personal issue. So any other calls for nominations? Otherwise, we'll ask Janet to call the roll on the motion for Commissioner Good as Vice Chair made by Commissioner McCauley and seconded by Commissioner Nelson. Hey, Commissioner Good. Aye. Commissioner McCauley. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Strother. Aye. Commissioner Aitis. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, Item six, chair and member comments. I only have one I'd offer up and maybe it's more of a question and I don't know, Mary, to you or to Tom or to Tracy, but I've been, it's been mentioned a couple times before as the department has gone through staffing issues and I've seen some of the recent communication, I think it was specifically as well with COVID at Braemar with having people step up and uh, just from a personal basis as well as I've had a couple people ask me, is there uh, still a need for, I'm going to call it temporary floating staff? Is there a way that it would make sense if they're members of the community that would say, you know, whether it's paid, whether it's unpaid, I don't know how the city would have to do it. But if there were people that were interested in putting their names in as well, so you didn't just have to continue to shift city staff around, is there a process to do that? Uh, an individual that's a good contact contact point, just curious as to both the need and the process to fill that need if it's there. Thank you. Uh, Tracy and Tom can, can jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we currently have all of those positions that we are continually short on advertised on our website. And I know if you are wanting to fill in, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to become a, a full-time or maybe not a full-time, but a, a part-time or seasonal worker for the city. So I would think of there's, there's two ways to do that is to either um, um, apply and you can actually go through and um, with the need, you know, good quality candidates kind of we we handle those one on one. The other would be um, if to just contact the facility itself, you know, if you if you have someone in your family that has prior Zamboni driving experience, um, we want to talk to them. Um, the, the problem always ends up being is nobody wants the Friday night shift. They don't want the Saturday afternoon shift. They don't want the Sunday morning shift. But um, but obviously it's it's been a challenge through um, you know obviously two things uh, you know the pandemic and uh, case management as well as just you know the general aspect of where employment uh, numbers are um, at this time as well. So it has been a challenge. We are grateful that a lot of people have stepped up to kind of bridge us through that little bit of a gap, but. I would say two things. If you are interested, we are constantly hiring. We're constantly evaluating applications. And the second is if you have a unique skill in one of those areas, whether it be the arena or you like to clean up after birthday parties, um, you like, you know, maybe there'd be a cupcake in it for you or not at the end of the night. But um, um, to reach out to us so we can connect those folks up right with the, the facility manager, find out the needs, if the schedule's available, they can apply online. Um, or or just look to to volunteer in that aspect as well. So. Okay. Hey Perry, um, what if someone has experience driving Zamboni once, but loved it and wanted to be trained and might do it on a volunteer basis and be available for those times? Is that something you'd be willing to look at? Do they have their own insurance? Like what kind? Health insurance? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> auto insurance. Like drive through the boards. Yeah, yeah, the Zamboni stand. insurance. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm projecting that it's you, but if it's no, not no, you, no, 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 it's not me. No, oh, it's not me. okay, all right. We are insured then. Um, <laughs> yes, I would say if you have someone to reach out to to Tracy and I, we can connect you. That that individual up with Chad, they can talk it through. Again, look at schedules. I think um, I think that's a, a wonderful way to help maybe build up our bench a little bit through that aspect. Okay, Eileen, there's a special Z license you have to apply for and prove that you can drive on ice. Oh, really? <laughs> there are still a lot of levers on it. It's, but. I have a motorcycle license. Does that count? 
<laughs> you can spread water behind it. Yeah. <laughs> can I piggyback on this and mention that the summer job applications are also out there and we really need help networking through the community to fill all these jobs we have open with the youth in Edina. That's usually our our uh, our base employee and I'm projecting a pretty good shortage of employees this summer. So if anyone has anyone in the community that will be looking for work, so please suggest they should work for Edina. Hey, Tom, mm -hmm. we connect at all with the school district through like the counselors at the high school or anything like that to make that, um, you know, just to broadcast it and market, you know, not market, but, you know, communicate it. We have in the past. I don't know if we have anything out there at this moment, but we have in the past. Tracy, do you want to mention anything? Yeah, they put yeah. out a newsletter like Fisher, weekly. That yeah, Commissioner McCauley, people. we uh, we actually have a contact at the high school that we actually act ac accessed for the warming house attendance, and we doubled our list of applications by doing that. So we have a contact that we worked with at the high school. Um, we're also trying to see if we can get, I don't know, with COVID and the pandemic, if they're doing any type of um, us visiting during their lunchtime, but we're trying to see if we can arrange some type of in-person connection as well. So we have made connection with both the Dinah High School, and then we're also making connections with some of the surrounding cities, high schools as well, in the same capacity. Tracy, could I suggest that, I mean, they put out like a communication weekly from the school district, sometimes from the high school, but also maybe flyers in the lunchroom at the high school if you can't get in there personally? That's what we're, that's what we're trying to work on. Okay. Yep, either something we can hand out if we can't get in, get a face-to-face -face, uh, connection. Can I piggyback on that? I was actually asked at, um, I was at a choir concert right before this and someone actually asked me that question around the the age and then um, and I said, I'm pretty sure it's 16 still, um, but they wanted to understand around the, um, the volunteer part of it. So if you're 15, can you volunteer? And if you volunteer, what is the requirement? So I don't know if there's much, um, I couldn't answer the questions. Um, so it might be something, and maybe that information is easy to find. I just couldn't easily access it. But um, I think there's kids out there who have volunteer hours they wanna do and start to build their resume that um may not want to sign up for their whole summer 40 hours but may be interested um her exact words was his favorite thing he ever did as a kid was the park programs which i was like yay and so he wants to help other kids um so maybe just like a tuesday thursday from one to four or something like that um as a volunteer so i don't know if what the ruling on that is but it literally I was asked me this right before I came tonight, so I thought I would bring that up as a um, the volunteer aspect of it for the under 16s. Yeah, and maybe if we're able to get some written communication or an in person, we can piggyback both the volunteer opportunity because we do have that. Amanda has that with the playground program, um, the volunteer program, so we could add that information and we probably need to get that information on our website too in a little right. better. Do you think it's on the website? I mean, Edina Moms um, has a pretty mad Facebook entertainment value um, that we can get a lot of things happening. Moms are um, real helpful. So I think that it might, if there's a good way to point to them, I would have, I, it would be helpful. And then we can just, you know, it's great to use the, the normal communication aspects, but there's a lot of moms out there who are help, wanting to help their kids find something and the kids aren't being as, um, they're not as opportunistically looking as they could be um, to what's right in front of them. Little, and they're all trying to pick out their schedules for next year. There's a lot going on. So I think if we could update the website with some of this easy to find information, it would we could easily communicate out. And I think um, might be more helpful too. Those are great ideas. I appreciate that. And we'll try. I know we have a connection, I think, to some of the moms groups. And we've also connected with some of the neighborhood association, getting word out that way as well. So. Yeah. Or we'll take any idea at this point to try to get the information out. Well, being that it's some of the, um, the Udana Moms last meetings, if you update the website, want to tell us afterwards somehow so we can help communicate it, um, that would be helpful. I'm happy to advocate and tell people, but um, I'm probably not going to look online to look for it to be updated until I know it's updated. Okay, great. Thanks. One other thing I was going to ask Tom while um, we have you in the hot seat was, a few months ago, and I don't remember when we talked about there are some volunteers out there, not kids so much, that are volunteering a little bit with, um, I think with Luther's group 
around helping prepare like the parks in the spring to weeding and before they planting or maybe planting the flowers under the um, beautiful signs or whatever that is. Um, again, I don't know how we tell people that, but um, like I'm the point person for Todd Park for the association of Todd Park as well as for our group, but um, I've never been able to figure that information out when people ask me. So I don't know if, again, that's a good way to tell people um, how they can be um, advocates for their park, um, weeding or whatever, unless they just want to go out and randomly weed, which I don't see that happening, but. Yeah, and we can work to assemble some information. We do have a uh, an initiative this year to plant a thousand trees in Edina, so we might be looking for more volunteers for some upcoming items. But we can work to try to assemble some information. You could help us get out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would be happy to if I um, if we know if I know where to point people to or to look at it. Um, I think that again, there's a lot of people who want volunteer hours as well as just to get out and. Um, be outside because people are over winter. Except for the hockey people, they want hockey winter all year round. I'm not that person. That sounds I like have, it sounds like we just wait, did a, work, a lot of work on initiative number three there to back up a bit, huh? Right. Expanding our volunteer assistance for park initiatives. Right. So we're, we're moving that one along tonight. I have just uh, a few comments. Uh, Sunday in the Star Tribune on the front page, there was a, the first part of the article was about sales tax. And then later on, I think on page five, it did mention Edina and the revision uh, or working on the two uh, master plans and the work uh, that's going to happen at the arena. So it was some nice press. Um, Second thing, in the annual report for About Town, it listed the 135,000 that was given to the city. Many of those items, if not a majority of them, were in the park system, um, the benches, the parks, just a great uh, outpouring um, of community philanthropic work. Um, in relationship to that, and it'll be in the annual report for next year, a friend of mine, some of you may know Pacey Urk. Um, at the BGA board, we had talked for years about getting a clock for the golf course, similar to the clock that's over in Centennial Lakes. And Pacey has um, donated $30,000 to have one at the golf course that'll be close to the putting green. So it's always been kind of a, a concern about there's no clock that's visible from you know, as you either at the clubhouse, you're on the putting green driving range, et cetera. So Pacey, um, lifelong resident of Edina, very, uh, very involved in our community. And I just, um, I wanted to thank Jay Meyerhoff. Jay had been the head pro at the golf course or director, director of golf and has left to go to um, Lafayette as their uh, director of golf. And I just, Jay and the whole staff at the golf course, I think received an award for the youth program of being the largest, if not the best in the state of Minnesota. And I think the ranking, Tracy can probably correct me if I'm wrong, was in the top 25 in the country in terms of that youth program. So um, we're gonna miss Jay. Um, Jay was certainly uh, very instrumental. Um, in that program, uh, Tommy Kohler, I believe, uh, is gonna take the reins there. And uh, we just have, I don't know how many hundreds, almost eight to 900 kids that were on the waiting list this year. So it certainly is a compliment to the hockey program. So we have two great, uh, great venues for kids in our community, I think. So that's uh, all my comments for the night. Thank you, commissioners. You're leading us right into some of our informational items. Uh, the first is just a reminder and also something to, to spread the word on um, if you wanted to, is that our first day of registration for our spring summer offerings will be on February 16th. 
and that will occur at noon, um, obviously through through our through our website and through Civic Rec. So if people haven't uh, made an account uh, since last registration or they want to update their account, it's always best to do that ahead of time. It's also why we start at noon and not 8 a.m. So no one's stuck uh, getting uh -huh. someone on the bus or trying to log in while they're stuck in traffic or anything like that. So uh, again, February 16th is that first day of registration. Uh, Chair Itis did talk about uh, the award at uh, Braemar Golf received, and it is correct. It's through the uh, PGA Junior League, and it is uh, the, the largest program in Minnesota and top 25 in the country. So, um, also another award for uh, the uh, Golf Range Association for the work at the golf uh, uh, range was a top 50 public facility in the United States. So, kudos to that staff, Joe Abood. Um, Jeff, Mary, Amy, Jay, Tommy, Greg, everyone that that works over there, Pat, um, are all fantastic and do such a such a wonderful job for us. So, um, the Centennial Lakes Park is uh, accepting uh, applications for the farmers market and just recently selected or uh, received applications for the music activities throughout there. So again, a lot of uh, summer planning going on there. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, the Next Gen Tree Program um, will be occurring this summer. It's the goal to plant a thousand new trees in Edina on public and private land. Um, and uh, Tom and Luther um, are overseeing that that wonderful project. So, um, a note: um, if you do hear it come up, um, the bridge over Crosstown that connects to Roslyn Park was was hit by a vehicle um unfortunately that's a mindot bridge um i guess fortunately it's a mindot bridge um i guess if you look at it that way uh the unfortunate part is it has closed that uh, access over over crosstown so um we do not have a timeline from mindot on that on what it could take to repair or anything like that uh there have been requests given to mindot that if and when the bridge ever was replaced that it needed to be ADA accessible. Um, now you've got a lot of stairs there. So um, those discussions had been going on from a purely planning standpoint. Um, however, we don't know where this will occur with the extent of the damage or, or what their decision might be. So just to clarify on that, we are, we are getting a lot of calls that has interrupted actually some uh, um, bike commuting, um, I guess you could say through that area. So uh, the bridge is heavily used even in the winter. And then the um, last is just some updates on our, our recreation staff, some updates to the Moody Pickleball courts. Uh, warming House is being open through the 20th. Um, as you mentioned, that staffing is also a challenge. So if any of you, you know, know of any good Warming House attendance as well, um, always need some fill-ins. And then the last is we've um, brought on a, a partner to, to help us on inclusion and uh, support that um, we can offer to our athletic associations also in our programming and that's reach for research reach for resources with inclusion services so uh, tracy and i have a, a history with them and they do a fantastic job and you won't see any drop off in the quality of service we provide for inclusion i guarantee you that so um if there are any questions we can answer them otherwise while you're thinking i'll move on to your your next meetings and events um, should be uh, determined probably this week or next um, on the movement back into in-person meetings. Um, wanted to draw your attention to the April 19th date. That's a Tuesday as well. Uh, that's your Joint City Council and Parks Commission uh, work session. If you recall that, that's uh, that's an early one. Starts at 5:30, and there's uh, um, always two commissions and that evening will be the parks commission and the arts and culture commission so um i think they went first last time so maybe it's your turn to go first we'll have to have to talk about that and then um the last item that i put on the agenda this evening was just a a recognition of um the years and meetings of service years of meetings uh that have gone on for two members here this evening and three in total, and that's Commissioner Nelson, Commissioner McCauley, and Commissioner Miller, who's not able to be here tonight. And we listed a, a number of their accomplishments in the packet this evening. Um, 
I'm not sure if they wanted to focus on any additional ones or, or their years of service, but just wanted to thank them from uh, the, the community perspective, what they help provide, um, the, the conversations, the goals, the, the effort that was put in, and then just the assistance to myself coming on new, um, you know, accepting into the, the community and um, helping define priorities and uh, all, all the like of that. So wanted to thank them tremendously. And I don't know if Commissioner Nelson or Commissioner McCauley has any, any thoughts on that. I know Commissioner Nelson and I, we discussed a little bit about some of your, your favorite projects that, that maybe you wanted to mention this evening. Um, you know, your work at Roslyn Park was, was a huge initiative on the, uh, the accessible playground. And you talked about the signage and we kind of joked about the in Grandview and Grandview and Grandview again in Grandview another time. So um, wanted to, to thank you all on that. So not sure if you others had comments or if, or if you had had anything to remark as well, but this is this is your last official meeting. So we wanted to save some time for you. Lauren, right, go ahead. Can't hear you. Unmute. Corin, can't hear you. I was just telling you I had my speech here, but then I was kidding and you didn't even hear that part. Um, I don't really have anything to um, to to say. I mean, I it's been a long and fun, um, more fun sometimes than others. Uh, I think this last year has been a real challenge to stay engaged with um, all the obstacles, but it's been a very fun time and I'm really glad for the people I met and um, I hope that I could still continue to see you guys in passing and I know I'll see the the Edina uh, staff with your green tags and when I see you over Caribou and, and around town. So I, I'm just really happy that I met people and um, I hope we can continue to make some progress and I'm gonna hope to see Greg find that money tree and uh, I'm glad I'm glad to see Grandview is going in the right direction. And um, yes, Roslyn was my most favorite project I did because I feel like it, even my kids still talk about how we helped take out that um, and I don't know if any of you were there besides Janet the day that I had a have a heated debate on camera about how we should should we or not fund it or not fund um, the um, the all inclusive. So it was one of my uh, favorite meetings. So you can go back and look it up. It was with uh, me and um, our uh, Edina school board person at the time. So yeah, it's funny. We'll find it on the YouTube channel. You should. You should. Um, I just uh, wanted to say uh, six years has gone by so quickly, um, but it's been a great education in how local government works. And I have such an appreciation for what staff and elected officials go through on a daily basis. I can't say enough about staff. Um, they've been great through the six years. Um, I hope everyone in the city realizes that these are not, you know, 830 to 430 jobs, as you can see from tonight. Um, there's a lot of extra hours they put in on extra projects and things like that. Um, Edina is a great city to live in and a great city to volunteer in. I understand we have over 90 volunteers stepping up for the commissions this year, which just speaks to how, um, how happy people are with uh, living here and you know, volunteering and giving their time to the city to make it um, a great place to live. Um, well, I'm sad to see the end of my term. Again, I'm encouraged with the amount of people that have stepped forward to uh, fill in these slots. And I want to thank all my colleagues on the Park Commission. Um, I've learned a lot from those of you who have been on the commission for many years. And I know you have good things uh, to work on going forward. Um, and just uh, keep the public informed and keep them engaged. And uh, I urge everybody in the city, especially if you're looking to run for elected office, please serve on commissions. It really teaches you about how um, the sausage making happens. And it is sausage making. It's just the nature of the game. So it's frustrating at times, but it's uh, it can be really rewarding. And um, I guess my favorite project as I end will be uh, Arden Park. I lived over in that neighborhood and I've still, we, people say, wow, that's so great what they did with Arden Park. I love going there now. I really go with my kids all the time for the creek and it was just a, a really, really good project. So that would probably be the, the one I will remember the most. Um, probably because I live there, but I think it's it's a beautiful park now. So thank you to staff. Um, thank you to my colleagues on the commission and uh, I wish you well going forward. And now I can send you emails. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, thanks, Eileen and Corin. Been great working with you and both of you. Great, uh, great service to the city and support on the commission. And I know from just a little bit you've shared tonight, you have both pleasures and some battle scars from going through some of these projects. So thanks for your efforts all the time. Um, I have, having lived in this city, let's see, almost 50 years, um, I just want to thank you uh, for me and my family. It's people uh, that volunteer, like the two of you, that uh, with all the time, the extra time that you take away from your families, you know, the nights and the task force and the meetings, uh, it's um, individuals like the two of you that make a difference of where we live. And I just want to thank you both. And maybe just to, to add on that, Rick, although he's not here tonight, publicly thank Mike as well for yeah. his years in yeah. service. And yeah. I know he came with some passion and yeah. some good talents for us as well. So certainly enjoyed working with Mike as well. Yeah, I agree. Chair and Commission, that uh, wraps up your business items for this evening. Okay. I'll um I, mean, ask, I think it's you uh, and I should be you and I should be the ones to do this, don't you think? Thanks. So. It should be. Yep. Yes, yes, absolutely. You go so ahead. Move, so move. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Janet, can you do a roll? Thank you, the two of you. <laughs> yep. Commissioner Good. Aye. Commissioner McCauley. Last time. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Strother. Aye. Commissioner Itis. Hi. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. You guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Nice. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night.